thank you for, for those of you that have sort of sent in questions beforehand as well, because that was really helpful to sort of focus what I'd, I'd talk through today. Um, and I'll, I'll try and keep it as, as brief as I, I can, and I'll take any other questions at, at the end as well. Um, sorry, I can't be there in person today as well. Um, but um, as Alison said, my name's Isabel Turbin. I'm one of the principal genetic counsellors at Addenbrooke's Hospital in the clinical genetic service there. And that's part of the East Anglian Medical Genetic Service. And so we'll start with some of the, the basics um, that I'm sure many of you know that the answers to already, but I think it's worth, worth going over them anyway. Um, so firstly, what is ring chromosome and how, why and when do they form? So what's the impact of this? Um, so chromosomes are, are structures that all of our genes are stored on and they all, they all come in pairs um, from and they're numbered from one to 22 in both males and females. And then um, the sex that's where it differs for the sex chromosomes. The, um, for the females, they have two X chromosomes and men have one X and one Y. Um, and so normally these are linear structures. And so a ring chromosome put simply is when one of these structures forms into a ring uh, instead of being a, a linear structure. And so there are a couple of ways that can happen. So um, Sometimes there's a break at both ends of one of those chromosomes. And so if we're thinking about chromosome 20 specifically, and um, there's a break at the end, and a little bit of the, the genetic material is lost off the end. And then those two ends fuse together and, and make a ring. And the other possibility is that um, actually sometimes nothing's deleted. Um, there's no breaks, but on the ends of those chromosomes, there's a, essentially a sort of protective cap called a telomere and they can fuse together as well so nothing's lost but it just fuses into a ring structure um, the other question was oh, when when do they form so um, they can happen um, at sort of any point or a few different points really so uh, sorry if I go back to this so uh, the diagram a where there's that breakage and a bit of deletion that usually happens during the formation of the egg cells or the sperm cells and um, before that they're, they're involved in fertilization so before they become an embryo and so then that ring chromosome is present in, in all of the cells that make up that embryo and then the person that sort of forms and results from that embryo that that ring chromosome would be in all of the cells of their body and then diagram B there, where there's nothing lost and the, the ends just fuse together, that usually happens early on in the life of the embryo. So it's not there right from the beginning, but it, it happens quite early on, which is what's shown in this diagram here. So it's, it's not present in that very first cell that's, that's formed, but at some point, um, a bit further down the line, one of the cells does um, have the ring 20 chromosome formed, and then all of the cells that then get sort of produced in that cell line also have ring chromosome 20. And that sort of um, led to the next question as well uh, about mosaic and, and non-mosaic ring 20. And so if, it, if that, um, that ring 20 is formed a bit further down, down the line, so not right at the beginning, then that can lead to what we call mosaic uh, ring 20, which means it's not present in all of the cells of the body it's present in some of the cells. And um, that's different to non-mosaic, which is where um, it's present in all of the cells of the body. Hopefully you can see that from the diagrams there. Um, with ring 20, it's, it's more common to be uh, non-mosaic. So two out of three cases, um, that, that's the case. And whereas the, the mosaic ring 20 is usually um, one in three people. Um, and that's, the as we sort of said before the, the mosaic type of ring 20 is where there's the um, the breakage and the loss of material and um, fusion so that's the less <laughs> type um, the other question is about sort of what's the significance of this um, so there's a bit of sort of controversy about what what is the significance of mosaicism in in ring 20 um, so to some extent, it does give a, an idea of when symptoms might develop, so when people might start to develop epilepsy, and um, what sort of the age of onset, how severely somebody is affected. But it doesn't tell us exactly when those symptoms may develop or um, how, how severely they will be. So in general, for children with um, non-mosaic ring 20, 
um, or a higher percentage, if they are mosaic, a higher percentage of cells that do have ring 20 in, then the seizures do tend to begin earlier, but it's no hard and fast rule. So there's always variability. Um, and the other question that came through, I think, was about sort of the percentage of, of rings found in the blood. How does that relate to rings in other organs? And um, for example, the brain, given that the main symptom is seizures. Um, the short answer is it doesn't really relate. What that percentage tells us is that on average, um, what percentage of cell of all the cells in the body have ring chromosome 20. But it what it doesn't tell us is which cells or which organs have ring 20 and what the percentage is in each of those individual organs. And um, if we wanted the answer to that, we'd have to test the specific tissues, um, specific organs, and that's not necessarily always safe or feasible either. Um, and so really to know what organs or particular cells that ring 20 is present in it, it depends where uh, sort of where that ring 20 forms in that sort of embryo formation, what cell lines are affected and which aren't. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean if just because the sort of seizures are the main symptom, it doesn't mean that that ring 20 is present in just all the cells that make up the brain, for example. It, it may, be, may well be, and we don't have all of these answers, but it, it may well be that just the genes that are on chromosome 20 or the, the sort of structure of ring 20 that's particularly expressed in the brain cells and so that's why it has more of an effect so all of the our genes are present in all of the cells of our body so they're in all of our organs but they're not necessarily all used in all of those organs and it might be that the, the, some of those genes on chromosome 20 are particularly important in our, our brain development um, in terms of does this percentage remain the same over time, it's tricky to say for sure. It's, it's likely that the percentage in the blood is fairly similar over time, but it is it's hard to say that with complete certainty. Um, another, I think, probably a common question is how does my diagnosis relate to the symptoms experience, which I think Alison touched on in, in her talk earlier as well. Um, the short answer is we, we don't know. It's something that there isn't a clear answer to. There are some theories though, so um, there are theories that perhaps the structure of a ring, ring chromosome being in a cell can affect cell division, which affects the viability of the cells, so sort of the ability of that cell to survive. Um, when cells divide, they replicate and copy all of the material, all that genetic material in their cells, so that then that's present in the next cell that forms. And so those ring chromosomes can get a bit tangled up in that process. And so that might affect sort of general problems with the cell. And perhaps that leads to, to some of the symptoms experienced with, uh, in ring 20. Um, it might be that, well, it's, it's likely actually that the symptoms are specific to chromosome 20 as opposed to generally being related to a ring chromosome, because we know there are other ring chromosomes and they don't all have the same symptoms linked to them. So it's, it's likely to be sort of chromosome specific as opposed to structure specific. Um, it may be related, related to some of the specific genes that sit on chromosome 20. Um, there are a couple of genes that I've named there that we know are associated with, with epilepsy. Um, and they're quite near the, the tip of the long arm of chromosome 20. And so if when that ring forms, that material is lost, um, although we know that only happens in about one in three cases, um, perhaps the loss of those genes is something that's contributing to, to the symptoms experienced as well. Um, but none of them are definite answers. So we, we really don't know exactly how that ring chromosome relates to the symptoms and um, can be experienced. Um, I'm conscious of, of time. Um, I'll I had a couple of questions about sort of supernumerary R20 and monosomy R20. And um, so supernumerary R20 is where there's an extra copy of the chromosome 20. So you have the two typical linear chromosome 20s and then the, the ring structure is sort of an, an extra chromosome. That, as far as um, I'm aware, is actually considered a different condition to, to ring 20 um, syndrome. So, um, and usually that's because actually somebody with supernumerary R20 has 
an extra copy of some of the genes that sit on chromosome 20. And that's usually what causes their symptoms because they've got too much genetic material. Um, there was also a question about monosomy. I'm not sure if I understood this question properly, but I'll, I'll give it a go anyway. Um, so monosomy R20 would suggest that the, the cells of the body only have one copy of chromosome 20. So um, usually all of our cells, we describe them as disomic or having disomy, which means two copies of all of the chromosomes. Um, you may have heard the type, term tri trisomy or trisomy, and that's where there are three copies of chromosomes or particular chromosomes. And so mono meaning one, monosomy means one copy of the chromosome. So monosomy R20 would suggest just one copy of chromosome 20 and it being in the ring formation. Um, now, if that was present in all of the cells of the body, that's not likely to be viable with life um, because the, the genes that sit on chromosome 20 are important and we need, in general, we need two copies of all of those genes. Um, but it is possible that um, there's mosaicism for this monosomy R20. So just some of the cells only have one copy of the, the R20 chromosome, the ring 20 chromosome. Um, so most of them perhaps have uh, the linear structure of chromosome 20 and the ring, ring chromosome, but in some of them, that normal structure, is, the normal linear structure is lost and they just have the, the ring 20. Um, and exactly how that would affect someone depend how many cells have, have that. Um, it could also be the other way around. So it could be that um, in some of the cell or most of the cells, they have the um, sort of ring 20 and the normal linear chromosome 20. But in some of the cells, that ring structure is lost. And so there is monosomy of chromosome 20 in some of the cells. And again, the, the symptoms and sort of impact of that would depend on how many cells have that. Um, the other possibility that this sort of monosomy R20 could relate to is actually talking, sort of thinking about that deleted genetic material. So if um, the ring forms in this way, where there's breakage and some deletion of the material, then some of, if there are any genes that sit in that, that section of deleted genetic material, for somebody that has one typical linear chromosome 20 and one ring chromosome 20, they will have lost their second copy of, of those genes that were in that deleted region. And so for those particular genes, they would be described as having monosomy for them. Um, so there's some possibilities. But I don't know if I interpreted that question right. Um, I think probably a common question is, can someone with R20 be a parent? Is it hereditary? So what does this mean? Um, so R20 usually occurs by chance, and you may see the term de novo use which means it's happened for the first time in that person so it's not that either of the parents had ring, ring chromosome 20 um, but it's happened as we said either just in the egg or the sperm cell or actually a little bit later in the embryo formation where that's the case when both parents just have typical chromosomes then it's unlikely that they would have another child with, uh, with r20 then there's also the question of what if i've got r20 what does that mean for my children um, so if somebody has non-mosaic R20, so that ring, ring 20 is present in all of the cells of their body, then the chance of them having a child is, is with ring 20 as well is 50%. And that's because of the way our chromosomes are inherited. So assuming that their, their partner has two typical copies of chromosome 20, they each put one of their chromosomes in their egg and sperm cells. So for the person with ring 20, they'll either put the typical copy or the ring copy of chromosome 20. And then for their partner, it doesn't really matter which they pass on. And then it depends which egg and which sperm cell comes together to form that embryo. And there's sort of four poss possibilities there. And the first is that they both pass on that typical copy of chromosome 20. The second is that um, the, other, the partner passes on their, their other copy, sort of typical copy. Or it could be that the person with ring 20 passes on their copy of chromosome 20 that's in the ring structure. So that's where that 50% or one in two figure comes from. If somebody has mosaic R20, then the chance can be anywhere between zero and 50%. So it, it really depends if that ring 20 structure is in their egg or, or sperm cells 
or if it isn't and and what percentage of their egg or sperm cells have that that ring structure in them um, sometimes it's it's possible to look at sperm cells to to, to test that but it's it's tricky to, to look at that really before um, sort of before conception um, but there are some possibilities different options available um, sort of reproductively so I mean one perfectly reasonable option is not to do anything to if somebody is um, non-mosaic just knowing that there's a 50 percent chance or if somebody is mosaic knowing there's somewhere up to a 50 percent chance and that child could have testing at birth or when they're older to find out if they have got ring 20. Um, it's also possible to test during a pregnancy so there's different ways of doing that and that can look at the baby's chromosomes and look to see how their, their chromosome 20s are arranged. Um, there's also something called pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, it was formerly PGD, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, but it's the same thing. And that's where the egg and the sperm are fertilized outside of the body, a bit like IVF, so in vitro fertilization. And then the embryos are tested. So the embryos can be, the sort of chromosomes of the embryo can be looked at, and only embryos that have got the typical chromosome 20 structures can then be used. Um, so that is an option that would be available for, for anyone with, with R20. Um, and then the last question that um, may be on a few of your minds is, what should I ask my genetic counsellor if I'm meeting with them? And I think the important thing to say is there's no right or wrong questions. There's, there's no silly questions. Nothing is too small a question. Um, but certainly we recommend j jotting down any questions you think of leading up to your appointment. Um, and some of the things you might think of are, so, well, what is a ring chromosome? So a lot of the questions we've covered today, really. How did it happen? Will it happen again? Questions about mosaicism, um, about family planning, about your other family members. Um, also things like how to talk to my child about the condition. So we're always happy to sort of talk through how to share that information with, with other people in the family um, and questions about reproductive options as well. Um, Sorry to whiz through it all. That's all the questions I'd, I think, been sent ahead of time. But if there are any other questions, then very happy to take more.